Okay, let's see. Let's see what we got today. Open up Outlook. Take a look at my recent emails here. And my other emails, and I got plenty to respond to, so I'm going to try to get to those. I got my emails in my podcast queue. Those, of course, I'm almost behind by two weeks again. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Got to get to those. And um, my to-do list is growing exponentially. And, oh, I got to take a look at my latest far side on my desk calendar. <laughs> that was pretty good. Okay, so that's the next one. And what else? What else? So you're probably wondering what the hell this is, aren't you? <laughs> this is me at my desk just doing my normal morning routine. I got up and I thought I had the I had the opinion after I showered and my usual stuff. My wife and I go for a walk and I thought, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, well, that's actually true. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I don't know what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I haven't written up a script. I have zero notes. You know, even when I go off the cuff, I usually have an idea of what I'm going to talk about. But I just got back in town. I kind of want to, I, I don't kind, I want to talk to you all. I'm, I'm itching to do that because I love doing this. And I thought, you know what, let's just, let's just hit record. Just hit record. That's what I did. I just hit record. And I was talking through a little bit of how I open up Outlook and I look at the emails and I go through things and that's all this is. I don't know if it's going to be um, total crap or <laughs> semi-total crap on this. You can tell I'm a little ornery today and that happens sometimes. But I wanted to try something different. This is a mid-month episode, not the more standard um, format, which I'll probably do again at first of the month. But, you know, I just haven't talked to you. I've been on the road. I wanted to touch base and catch up. So, I don't know. Stay tuned. You might learn something you don't know before. You might not and it may be an utter waste of your time. I have no clue. <laughs> but you know what? Give it. Give it the five-minute test, the 10-minute test. My wife and I do that with movies a lot. Give it the 10-minute test. See what you think. I'll be right back. Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 106 of the Benzo Free Podcast. Hopefully you heard my little intro there, and you know that this is, this is just me talking. It's just me talking today. I, I don't know where I'm going to go. I have absolutely no idea. You're going to hear my creak of the chair. You're going to hear some ambient sounds, because I did zero prep for this. Usually... When I get ready to record a podcast, I'll turn off the air conditioning or heater. Um, I'll turn on my light. I have a light, a hallway light in the stairs, which lets my wife know I'm recording. <laughs> and so I don't even have the door closed. She may pop down here while um, I'm talking to you. She'll probably hear me and think I'm on the phone or something. But <laughs> I just, I got back in town and I thought, okay, I got to start writing up a script. And I need to do this and probably need to get a mid-month um, podcast out. I'm trying to get out two a month now, and hopefully we're going to grow that even more here soon. But I just, I don't know, I didn't want to write the script. I just wanted to talk. I just wanted to say hi. I just wanted to touch base. So I have zero agenda. <laughs> it's just me in the basement and I'm touching base. I've been all over the map lately. 
Um, and if you know, I was on the road for a while and I'll mention that hopefully in a few minutes if I remember to, and maybe I won't, <laughs> but hopefully I will go back. I'm sure I will go back and edit this. Not too much though. I'm going to try to leave everything in by editing. I mean, I'm going to go back and clean up, you know, clicks and stuff like that. And I usually figure out the chapter list and that chapter list, as you all know, is in the show notes, um, the description. And you can always go to a section. And the nice thing about the chapter list, it kind of tells you what I talk about. So you'll be able to see this as you're listening to it. So you know more than I do right now <laughs> because I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. But I'll create that list when I, when I do the edit. You are listening to it and you already know what's coming up if you look at the chapter list. So you have the advantage, <laughs> I guess. I don't really know. I sound a little bit ornery. I'm all over the map, to be honest. Um, when I come back from road trips, I've been gone for a couple weeks, I'm often lost and don't know how to get back into routine, don't know where to go. And um, I don't know. I think all of us face that sometimes, that confusion, that loss of direction. I know I do. I have some really great plans for the podcast. I mentioned those for you, and I'm excited about launching a a new platform, um, a subscription platform, a membership platform, whatever you want to call it, um, next year. Uh, I think it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to getting that up and up to speed. Also getting back with some of the work of the Benzo Action Work Group. Um, I've been on emails with them a little bit while I've been gone, but just not much. we got to get back up to speed on the peer support training and other projects. So um, getting there and just corresponding. Also working on some of the research. We um, have our second paper from the survey in with um uh publication and we got some notes back so we gotta we do this whole dance for those of you who have done any medical research this dance we do with the uh, editors and they ask they ask questions or suggest changes and we go and rework things and go back and it goes a few rounds until finally they accept it and publish um and so that's the phase we're in right now with uh, that second paper from the survey and i'm really excited about this one even more so than the first one um this one has some really good stuff in it, and um, I, I'll let you know as soon as, of course, it, it becomes public. But I'm also breathing, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> breathing in because I'm talking fast, which I do when I ramble. Um, but maybe we should just call this the ramble episode. I know I talk about my rambling, um, and that's all this is going to be. It's just me doing that. But to get back to my subject, because... I'm going to try to stay on topic, whatever the topic it is I choose, but I know my mind does drift. But still, back to topic, um, which was, and there's the wall, the Benzo brain wall. Hang on a second, I was just saying it. God, it's funny. I think so many of you have shared with me how much you've experienced that and how much what I describe is relevant to your experience. And I'm, I'm so grateful, not that you all are experiencing it too. I'm just grateful that it's similar. And so we can tie it to benzos and we know it's temporary. Um, it may take a while, but it will get better. Mine has gotten better, although I still have this wall that goes up. Um, and I've seen it in other people. And many of you have shared with me, you've seen it in other people too. And it just pops up and it can be you know, you had it five seconds ago and suddenly it's gone. And I didn't used to have that, but that's the joys of bind, right? <laughs> For those who don't remember, bind is benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. It's a new term we're using. And in fact, this next paper is going to mention that. So we're going to have a paper out there too on that pretty soon. So I'm excited about that. Anyway, Back in the office, this is where I was, I remember now, back in the office, just kind of figuring out my direction, and I just wasn't motivated to write out a script and figure out the next topic, I will for the next one, but I just wanted to sit down and talk. I got tons of emotions running through me, and I think emotions are something maybe we can spend a few minutes on, hopefully the rest of you can relate to this, I think everybody can. Not to be really repetitive here, but of course, just lost my mom and my dad in the past year. Lost a couple cousins. Um, a couple of them are both of them really close to me, especially the last one to COVID on both of them um, in the last year. Lost my dog in the last, a little over a year ago. 
how we manage that really is individual and it creeps up on you and it's interesting. And then you got everything else in the world. There's so much going on in the world right now. It seems like we're eternally divided. Um, you know, if you're if you on the left politically, you can't understand why the people on the right are so crazy and um, ridiculous and all this sort of stuff. And if you're on the right, you probably can't understand why the left is so nuts and psychotic. And and if you're in the middle, you're you're wondering why both sides are so divided and trying to figure things out. And and you know, I this, we keep this podcast apolitical, and that's not about to change, but. What we can talk about is how the current environment out there affects us. And um, social media, boy, it can do a number on you. It's a lot of great things, but it also has a really strong downside, as we, as we can see. And I think it helps to divide us. I think our current political state helps to divide us. I think calling out people um, for being this way or that way or that side or this side helps to divide us. And I don't know. I, I think there's there's something we're going to figure out here to help hopefully work through this. But what I'm trying to get to is that this does a number on our psyches. Um, feeling that division. Sometimes there's hatred there. Sometimes there's rage. Sometimes there's just... I, I feel it too because even though I'm relatively centrist. I'm middle of the road on most things. I've leaned left sometimes. I've leaned right sometimes. I've said this before. This isn't new. Um, I've never once declared a political party. So if you start choosing an issue and start talking on a podcast, you suddenly eliminate half your audience. And that's the last thing I want to do. Um, but I have issues that I feel strongly about. I'm human. I am human. So some of these issues hit my core values. Every one of us, I am sure, has seen news articles in the last day, probably, let alone week or month, that strikes at our core values and are very difficult to process. I'm no different. I struggle with this. I, As I've spoken many times on this podcast, I did not pay attention to news. I didn't watch any news for probably four or five years during my recovery. It was that strong. The reason I didn't, because I couldn't deal with its effects. I couldn't, it would work me up so much. And that, and that elevated state of anxiety and anger, I'll admit there was some anger and, and hopelessness, even more hopelessness than anything else could last for a week, for days at least, or a week, instead of just letting it go. Now, the good news is I watch some news now, not still not as much, but I watch some now, and I pay attention to some things going on in the world, and I do get to let it go of it much sooner, and that's a huge gain for me. And I just want to say that out. That, that's success, and that's something we need to pay attention to. For those of you who have external stimuli seriously affecting your mood, and your anxiety, and your worries, it does get better. It does get better. I am able to manage these. I still get worked up, but they don't last for weeks or days. I can let go of it within an hour or two, or even sooner, and I can move on. And I found, I found some techniques that help me with that, but also I think it's just my healing. And I wanted to share that with you because that's a positive thing. That's a real big change I've experienced is that type of healing. I am getting better and um, I'm dealing with these things. But that to be said, I've been through a lot of, I want to use an expletive here, <laughs> but I'm not going to because we are, we are, this podcast is not, um, does not use language, but I've been through a lot of crap. Okay. Lately, I mentioned with my folks, my dog, my cousins, all the trips taking care of my parents um, back and forth to Kansas City all these additional trips with the weddings and everything else. And just been, it's been nonstop. I'm finally back now in the office and at home. And this is the beginning of no plans for me. D is back home for a while. And 
there's some confusion there. There's some loss. There's some, I mean, I have been just taking care of family a lot lately and traveling to do so and managing funerals and weddings and all this kind of thing. And that's all I've been doing. And then trying to do my work and f do a podcast and, and do the action work group in between and these papers. And now I'm back and I can focus more on some of the long-term things I've been wanting to do, especially with the podcast. But all that stuff that's been going on now that I'm back, it's, it's going to be processed. And there's no right way to process our emotions. I think there might be some wrong ways. Um, <laughs> I think taking it out on others, especially violence, these are unhealthy methods of dealing with our emotions. But for the most part, how you deal with them internally is up to you. It's your choice. Um, many of us seek support, as I do. Um, right now, I'm not seeing a counselor, but I have seen a counselor many times throughout my life, including during my initial days and my first couple of years of um, benzo withdrawal of bind. And I really am thinking I'm, I need to go back because I have some major life events that I need to process, and I understand that. But even if you don't have the loss that I'm talking about, even if you just turn on the news, you are still dealing with some emotions, most likely. It's, it's a very emotional state right now in this world. And everybody seems, not everybody, that's being exaggerating, but many people seem to be very strong in their opinions and their beliefs and what they think is right. And that makes other people who may have a differing opinion of what is right or what are what is true it might make them feel angst because they're facing that person and this builds and has become has turned into a state of i think unrest may be a, a nice diplomatic way to say that within this country in the u.s and around the world I keep hoping there's a better way, a way for us to stop calling out and yelling at people and being mean to people and being cruel and instead stopping for a moment and listening, actually listening to somebody else, not writing them off for something you think they are or something you think they believe, but instead actually listening to what somebody says, absorbing it. And then if you want to debate or give a rebuttal and explain your feelings, I think that's great. But so many of us aren't willing to listen. I think that would be good. Was, my, was that my podium? Was that a lecture? I really didn't mean to lecture because I got to say one thing more than anything else. I don't know anything. <laughs> I learn things as I go along. A few things stick with me. Um, with the benzos, I will definitely learned more than about some other subjects. And I share that with you, but I'm not going to say that I have the answers. I don't. Not for the world, not for bind, not for mental health. But I like exploring it. I like the conversation. I love learning about us, about who we are, why we think the way we do. Is it evolutionary? Is it divine? Is it something else is it aliens i don't know <laughs> um and some of these things might sound crazy to some people and some may not to others but i don't have the answers but i do think it's interesting to to look into why we do the things we do why we say the things we do why we believe the things we do and i think it's a good thing to step back slow down and be curious and stop being so reactionary, but instead be curious. If somebody says something that is absolutely the opposite of what you believe, maybe try stepping back for one moment and just try to understand why. Why do you believe the way you believe? And why does this person believe the way they do? I don't know. Maybe that's Pollyanna. Maybe that's just ridiculous. <laughs> like I said, I don't have the answers, but I think there are some basic things we can do to be more supportive, be more respectful, be kinder to each other. You know, I'm always about kindness on this 
podcast, and that's something I feel very strongly about, is if only we could treat each other a little more kindness. I think that would help. I think that would help. So there's one subject. <laughs> anyway, the these feelings, these emotions, unfortunately, when we're in bind or benzo withdrawal early stages or wherever you are in it, they become 10 times as hard to manage. That's why I stopped news. That's why I, I isolated myself. That's why I did that for a long time because I was in that heightened state. And it's, it's, it's a very difficult place to be. I know it. I've been there. I'm not as much there, but I still get triggered, I guess is the word. I still get elevated um, in my feelings by external things. And I think the real answer for all this is not to focus on the external so much, but to focus on the internal and say, why do I get so worked up? And what can I do within me to help ease my reaction? At least for me, that's what I worked on. And I found a lot of things that helped and it got me through. I found meditation. I found yoga. I found Tuning out. I distracted myself. I, I avoided media for a while. Not permanently. I'm like I said, I watch some now, but I I I stood back a little bit and said, that's not something I need to focus on right now. Trust me, the world's still gonna be there. <laughs> Even though some of us may not feel that way. It's still gonna be there when you've recovered some more. But it's okay to step away and think about something else and work on something else. And I know that's hard to do, but, but we need to. And, and it's so addictive. Oh my God. I found that with myself lately. YouTube has become my more recent addiction. I pull up YouTube videos and, you know, I go looking for calming things sometimes. Sometimes I look for other things. I look for comedy sometimes, um, different topics and stuff. But of course I also come across political stuff sometimes. And sometimes that stuff elevates my emotions, whether it's something somebody said that I totally don't agree with or something somebody said that I totally agree with. Either way, there's this hit we get. There's this hit we get. And I know we get that from Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and all these other platforms that I don't even know exist because I'm barely at all on social media. But we've got to learn how to be careful with that because Social media, in its essence, kind of lives for triggering people. I mean, the more some story elevates that emotion within you, the more likely it's going to get hits. That's why they have these titles out there in all caps or... Or their titles on their screens, like on YouTube, that are in red and white, just jump. They want to get your attention so they can get the views or the clicks or the likes, so they can get the monetization, so so that the company can do better and so that they can do better and get money for what they do. And it all feeds itself. But when you look back and wonder why we are so polarized and divisive and angry it's hard not to see that social media digital media youtube all these different things aren't part of that i'm not saying they need to be eliminated i'm not saying they're all bad but it's a factor you ever notice how easy it is to write maybe you know i'm not sure if you've done this but write a nasty comment to somebody online it's easy. Somebody says something you don't like, you write back and say mean things about that person. Come on, we've all done it. I've only done it a few times. I don't do it much because only because I'm not on social media. <laughs> but if I was on there more often, I am sure I would be tempted to do it more often. But I think most of us have had that, either at least that temptation, if not actually done that in the past. But picture this, if that same person was standing in front of you. They're not online. They're not some anonymous drone by the name of, you know, Eagle Eye 22 or whatever. I'm just making that up, you know. <laughs> and and it's, it's not this faceless person. It's not somebody who you're looking at. It's not somebody who you get to see the reaction of your words in their face. 
that makes it easy to say bad things. But when we're face to face, it's different. We see, we see the results of our words. And I think it makes it a little harder to say mean things. Now, I'm not, again, coming at this from a left side. I'm not coming from right side because I see this across the board. <laughs> this is not a political issue on one side or the other. Both sides do it. Trust me, <laughs> they do it plenty. And people on both sides are always kind of, are just seem to be going after each other. But social media gives us a place, kind of like road rage is what I look at. Road rage is one of those things that happens because somebody cuts you off and you're just cussing at them and saying all the worst things. And you might even be tempted to go back and cut them off and end in something horrible. But it's so much easier to do that because you're not seeing that person face to face. You're not standing there in front of them. If this was somebody cut you off in line at Starbucks, say, or something, or Einstein bagels, or wherever you get food, or McDonald's, somebody cuts you off, you may say something harsh to them, but usually that calms down and you see the reaction and you work through it. But when it's just you yelling at somebody, and then they yell back and you don't see that face, you don't get that reaction. It's hard to reduce the escalation. It's hard to de-escalate the situation. I'm just going off here, aren't I? <laughs> I mentioned I was stepping down from that soapbox, that podium, whatever it was, but I'm not. I'm still talking. Look, I don't have answers, but one of the things I do know is with Bind and with our escalated reactions to things that go on around us, okay, to external stimuli, we have a few choices. If you need to distract and turn off, unplug, pull away, do it. It's okay. Many people have pulled away from reading horror stories and Benzo horror stories and being on the groups because they can't take it. Well, that goes with social media too. If you're getting too much influence and you notice yourself and your reactions after you read some tweet or see some video, excuse me, I had a little something, something in my throat there I had to swallow. Okay. But if you, if you get that reaction, that's probably not healthy, especially when you're going to be 10 times the escalation of what you would be normally. It's okay to tune out. And it's also good to work on techniques. I worked on meditation, yoga. There's breathing exercises. There's so many things you can do. There's rationalizations you can do. There's logic. There's reasoning exercises you can do to help to decrease the effects of these external stimuli on yourself. Trust me, there's plenty of options out there. There's plenty of books on it. There are plenty of sites that help you with it. Find something that works for you so you can manage your emotional responses, especially during the heightened periods of early withdrawal and early bind. I think that's that's helpful. Yeah, maybe I'll wrap that one up. <laughs> I don't know. That probably sounded a little soapbox-ish, and I do that sometimes. But again, please know, um, I'm not judging anybody here. It's not what I do here. We all have it harder than a lot of people right now because of the medication we took. I don't know. I don't know. No more tangents. Okay, let's go on to some happier things. <laughs> That's D and his um, diving into frustration, anger, and whatever else there is. But um, we just got back. We were on the road for two weeks. Drove from Denver up through Nebraska. I think we hit 11 states. We drove through Colorado, Nebraska, dropped down into Missouri, and um, went on through the northern part of Missouri into Illinois, did some things in Southern Illinois, went to Garden of the Gods, not the one in Colorado Springs, because that's the one I know, but my wife and I went and hiked a little bit around Garden of the Gods in Shawnee National Forest, Southern Illinois. That was kind of cool. And we kept going on down through Kentucky, um, took my first ferry, um, car ferry that I'd done in a long time, not by choice, we just kind of happened, but it was kind of cool, crossing a river. And went to Tennessee and went up in Nashville. We spent a couple nights there and did things in Nashville. Um, went to the Ryman Auditorium. That was pretty cool. Grand Ole Opry. Um, I'd been there when I was much younger. It was good to go back and tour that. We toured the Country Music Hall of Fame. I, I love all kinds of music. There's very few music 
groups. I, I mean, I'm rock, I'm country, I'm all kinds of things, but it was good to get that history um, and see some of that stuff. We did some other things through Nashville, rented some scooters, <laughs> rented scooters and rode around downtown on scooters. That was kind of cool. So my wife and I did some fun stuff, got some good food. Um, also met with um, one of my colleagues, um, not colleague, I guess colleague. Ooh, it sounds so, um, it doesn't sound right. There's no way this guy should be my colleague. He's much, <laughs> I think he's so much better than, um, much, much higher level than I am. Anyway, a psychiatrist friend of our, of mine um, at Vanderbilt University in, in Nashville and got a chance to meet with him. Um, there's two doctors, two psychiatrists there at Vanderbilt that I work with through our research team and it was great to meet up with one of them the other one um unfortunately was not available because he had family in town and was spending time with his family um, um but i'll hopefully catch him next time but it was great to to have lunch with him so did all that we went down to pigeon forge and i went to dollywood <laughs> that was kind of cool i'm just telling you things to catch you up um we also did some more touring around there then we went on to north care into south carolina and then up into north carolina it was right on the border called ocean isle and we went to a wedding there at Ocean Isle Beach, and that was my niece's wedding. Everything went great. Um, it was beautiful um, on the beach, really, really nice. And then we grabbed my nephew. We went back to um, Smoky Mountains, Asheville, and went and toured Vanderbilt. Um, the I'm sorry, not Vanderbilt. Yeah, the Biltmore, the house from the Van Vanderbilts. Um, and then drove on up and dropped him off in Columbus, Ohio. And then we made a beeline back to Kansas City so that I could um, close out my parents' accounts from the estate because I needed to hit the bank before they closed. So, And got a chance to have breakfast with my sister before we hit the road the next day and got home. That was our trip. About two weeks, eh, almost two weeks to the day. Um, maybe two weeks and one day. Not that you need to know the itinerary, but there you go. Um, I did plan to meet up with some people and record some Benzo chats. I didn't get that in. Um, I was really focused on family this time and there was a lot of family stuff going on and also some time just for Shanna and I to spend some days in Tennessee, just kind of chilling out and doing some fun things, things we haven't had a chance to do in a long time. So, so that was good, but that's what I got back from. So not a lot happened work-wise while I was gone. Some things were going on. I still had some meetings, but I tried to take as much time off and, and do that, and it was good to get back. So we drove home in the rain on Saturday. Yeah, on Saturday, raining all the day through Kansas, and it was kind of nice, and then pulled in, and it was good to be home. It's good to be back. I was talking about the loss we've had and emotions and stuff like that, and right there I just started tearing up. I don't know. I just, I think... Maybe summarizing the past couple of years with my parents and with everything else going on, just so much has happened that my emotions are on, on the cuff, and that's a good thing. <laughs> I am learning. That's a good thing, and I've learned that, and it's okay to have the tear, the tears in my eyes. In fact, let me grab a Kleenex here. <laughs> but um, emotions are who we are. This is our emotions, and it's okay. Ah, uh, it's okay to have emotions. It's okay. It's, I think it's important to know how to deal with them and realize that they're not always reality, but at the same point to enjoy them and let them work through the process and learn how to move on from them. I think those things are important. I do have some interviews coming down the line, down the pike. Is it pike? Our pipe. I always get that one mixed up too. <laughs> Coming down. And already got a couple scheduled. So in the next month or two, we're going to have some really good interviews for you coming on the podcast. I'm excited about that. This is an extremely emotional journey. There's not a lot of things out there that are more emotional than this. It's because this drug has directly affected our ability to handle the world around us, our own feelings, our own cognition, our own memory, how our nerves, how our nerves in our body react and create burning skin and ticks and all kinds of complications. 
digestive complications. We know those well. I I have abdominal distension right now. <laughs> I'm not belittling at all because I had stomach problems and acute withdrawal. And now, for some reason, now I'm getting the abdominal distension. I don't know why. My diet's not been good. I will admit that. Being on the road, it didn't get much better. And right now, being back here, I'm focused on improving my diet significantly. But that's not the only cause. My diet's been bad before, and I haven't had this. But if I take my shirt off and I stand sideways, I look about seven months pregnant. Welcome to the world of abdominal distension. I've talked with many of you in the past who have had this, and I don't remember having that kind of swelling, I guess is the term, back when I was in acute, but I'm getting it now. Now, it's okay. It's not really painful. It's not, you know, it's it's achy. I mean, achy is in hard to move sometimes and stuff like that, but... It's manageable, like all the symptoms, and I'm going to work through it, and I'm going to try to improve my diet and make things better. But these things still happen to me. And yet I still consider myself a success. Because I've come so far. So far from where I've been. So far from where many of you are right. I have a good life now. An amazing wife. That really helps. <laughs> but a good life right now. But I've also had a lot of loss lately. You know, I think sometimes that maybe these podcasts and writing back to you in emails is my therapy. We used to have a joke when I, I I did a short stint as a psych tech in a mental institution in a, in a um, in psychiatric hospital back when I was in my 20s. And one of the ongoing jokes was trying to decide who should be the inmates and who should be the caretakers. <laughs> you know, the doctors, the nurses, and the psych techs. And it was an ongoing joke because so many people that go into mental health are people who have had mental health problems. Makes sense. And so sometimes when you look at these things, and, you know, for me, I think talking with others and helping others helps me as much. And I think there's something to that. I think for many counselors, they probably get something out of their counseling sessions for themselves. Having a job you love that creates meaning in your life is a very good thing. And so I, I think it makes sense. But I think I get that from talking with each of you. So often the questions I get, of course, are how long did you have this symptom or how long did you have that or how long until you started feeling better or how long until, or when did you finally, I had one just the other day, when did you finally feel healed? Well, considering I can't say I'm healed yet, that's a difficult one to answer. Eight years of clonazepam, off of 12 years of clonazepam, one to two milligrams. And I'm not fully healed. Why is that? I mentioned on this podcast many times, there's a lot of extenuating circumstances that may have fed to that. I did updose during coming off of it. I did take a floral quinolone, which can cause neuropathy on its own. Um, I drank some alcohol periodically. I still think that might be a factor at times. We all know that there are some similarities and cross tolerances with alcohol and benzodiazepines. I made some other mistakes too. So this, this doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, just because of the clonazepam taken for 12 years is why I still have symptoms eight years out. It's probably a combination of all the things. It's probably genetic. Maybe I had a higher predisposition. We don't know. We're trying to get research like that funded, but it's hard to hard to get those, that stuff. Research, and it takes time. But there could be a genetic factor. 
there could be a lot of factors. A lot of times there's a mindset factor, as I would call it, which is a, a psychological stability factor. People who are more psychologically stable often do a little better just because you have a higher starting point as far as handling the psychological distresses of this condition. So that makes sense. But the truth is we don't know a lot and we're trying to learn, but we don't know a lot. Yes, we're working on awareness, working on education. We're trying to educate doctors. We need a lot of work there. And we're still, we are making progress. I'm starting to see it. We're trying to train more support people and some more peer coaches so that those people can be available. That's part of this, what I'm talking about. But in the end, it's just being there for each other. I understand the desire once you get through this and you start to feel 90, 95, 98% better. You just want to give back to your life or on to your new life, probably more accurately. And you want to leave this behind. There is nothing wrong with that. It's a personal choice. There's nothing wrong with that. But for some of us, we found a new direction. We want to be there for those that follow behind us. And there's nothing wrong with that either. That's where I'm at. I'm surrounded by some amazing people, and I'm grateful that I get to work with these people day in and day out. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> but I can tell you, you can be involved too if you want to. I guarantee you, just let me know. We have ways of getting involved. One thing is to get involved with our work group. It's open to anybody. You don't have to live in Colorado to be part of the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group. We have many people from across the nation that are tied in, and a lot of the work we do, even though we start often in Colorado with it, has a national focus. That's a way to get involved. You can volunteer as an administrator for some of the support groups or discussion groups. That's a great, it's a hard task sometimes, but it's a great task to take up. You can volunteer your time at BIC or the Alliance or with me. You can get educated. You can go ahead and take peer support training. That's right. That's going to be coming up in 2023 and going to be available nationally. And you can get certified as a peer support coach. That would be cool. There's a lot of things you can do if you want to get involved in helping this out. You can raise awareness. You can try to work with a team within your own state, our own local government, our own country, wherever you're at, to maybe change some of the laws so that we understand that, hey, these have a propensity for dependence, which can cause long-term neurological damage. It's in the literature. Unfortunately, we've got to keep pushing to get the word out. But at the same point, absolutely no pressure and no shame on anybody who decides just to get back to the life they were in or onto their new life because you've paid your dues. It is okay. It's okay to go back and live. You've done your time. We don't judge here. It's not what I do. It's not me. It's not who I am. <laughs> it's just not in my nature. <laughs> I I want nothing more in this world than to love everybody. I know that sounds, I don't know what it sounds. I don't know the term for it, but it sounds kind of, <laughs> it sounds bad to me <laughs> sometimes. But <sighs> it's weird. It's like, you know, I always, you think that it's like, you know, if you hear somebody saying, oh, we just want a whole world to love one another and everything will be okay. It's like, yeah, that's, that's simplistic. I agree. But it's not a bad idea. It's not going to fix everything. It is not going to fix everything. That's not going to happen. But can it make things a little bit better? I don't see how it's going to go wrong. I truly am amazed by the people I meet. One of the one of those terms I like the most, um, and I'm not gonna I'm gonna bastardize it. I know, um, but I'm paraphrasing here. But it's basically, I think I don't know if it starts with be kind or something like that. But it starts with something like that, and then it says because everyone is fighting a great battle. 
be nice to people, be kind, whatever, because everybody is fighting a great battle. Whew. That gives perspective. That helps us, I think, start from a place of love and understanding instead of starting from a place of judgment and blame. And I think it's important. I really, truly am amazed by the people I meet, what they're dealing with, how they're dealing with life, how they're getting through the things they, be oh my gosh, you all that email into me, some of you have been through things that I can't even imagine. My, my battle with benzos was hard. I had some really hard times. I also know from the people that I work with, I mean, the people who have long-term complications with buying, I'm probably about average. There are people who have had it far worse than me. People who have been polydrugged and don't even know which drug to start to discontinue. People who have lost their marriages, lost custody of their children, wound up in jail. Yeah, these are the people I've talked to. Not saying these things to depress anyone because these are the minority, the exceptions. Most people come out of this just fine. And even if they have symptoms for a few months, those usually ease in a, in a short amount of time. Remember that the minority are those who have had symptoms lingering for months or years. We are the minority. So don't think that these horror stories are going to be you. But unfortunately, those stories are out there. And these are the people I work with. And even they find hope, power through, and come out on the other side better off. And that amazes me. That amazes me. The fact that I get to work with you all is a blessing. Uh, I should probably wrap this up. Um, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> I'm going to go back and listen to this and see if there's in anything here redeemable for a podcast. I think so far I have recorded one hour and nine minutes and 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, sorry, <laughs> seconds. Um, I'm sure I'll edit that down. Uh, maybe I'll let it down to an hour. Maybe I'll let it down to half an hour. I don't know. Um, if I went off on a tangent that just went nowhere and was entirely boring or useless, which I do, I might cut something like that out and try to get this down to something more reasonable. And maybe you'll give me some feedback and tell me that I should have cut the whole thing. That's okay. I didn't record anything, and this is what some of you might be thinking. I didn't record anything from this last trip. I was going to. I brought my recorder with me. Um, I had it for those benzo mornings and stuff like that. But I think I needed to get away from it for a bit. I think that's part of it. Plus, I was with my wife, and um, I don't have as much of the free time to go record because she and I, are, I spent a lot of time with her, and we, we were enjoying our time together um, doing things and, you know, having walks in the morning and breakfast and stuff like that. And it just didn't happen. And that's okay. I know that's okay. So when I got back, I was thinking, well, I don't have, you know, all this tape to edit down from my trip. So let me just record one right now. And that's what this is. So this maybe is my trip audio, <laughs> but without being on the trip. We had some good times. We learned some things. We got to see some family, some friends. And um, those are those are the road trips I take, and I enjoy that. Next time I'll probably record some more, because I like recording those um, for you as we go out and see the world. And I look forward to stopping by and seeing more people and Benzo Chats and such like that. We might even start setting up some meetings or seminars or whatever. I don't know, but... I want more of that. I want to get out there more. And I want to come out and start seeing some of you because I find that 
amazing. Like I mentioned earlier today, there's that thing about face-to-face -face that is the real connection, the real communication. And I value that. I value that. So anyway, so this is my trip. This is my trip recording <laughs> and um, my road trip report. Maybe. I don't know what I'm calling this, as you can tell. And I'm just rambling because I don't want to sign off because I'm liking doing this. I'm amazed when, oh my God, the other day, see here I keep going. I say I'm going to wrap things up, but I keep going. The other day, this has happened more than a few times. I mean, have you ever created something? Some of you probably have created stuff that has big followings or something like that. This is not one of them. I mean, we have a good following for our niche, but it's a small niche for benzo recovery, as you know. But I'm still amazed that, you know, I talk to some people that I work with and they say, you know, when I say, hey, well, I, you know, I mentioned that or on the podcast the other day. And this is what I said. Like, you know, we're talking about something benzos and um, some topic comes up, say, let's just say flumazenil, since we talked about that, flumazenil comes up and I might say, oh, yeah, I actually mentioned that on my podcast the other day. And this is what I said automatically assuming that these people don't know what's on my podcast. <laughs> and, and so often they'll say, oh yeah, I heard that episode. I'm like, wait, you listen to my podcast? <laughs> it still blows me away. It's the weirdest thing. It's like I had the other day, somebody said that this, um, this gal I work with and she mentioned um, another doctor and that met this doctor and this new doctor has some lot of information. And she said, oh yeah, by the way, she loves your podcast. And I'm going a doctor listens to my podcast and it's just uh, i don't know how i got here but i am grateful i am grateful and i'm blessed so what do you want to do now <laughs> My wife's line is always, you want to play some Parcheesi? <laughs> if we both wake up in bed and neither one of us are sleeping, she'll often go, so Parcheesi? I don't know why. We've never played Parcheesi, <laughs> but somehow that's become the thing um, when neither one of us can sleep. So you want to play Parcheesi? <laughs> um, and usually we <laughs> we find something else to do, read or whatever, and then one of us falls asleep. The other one, usually me, is still wide awake. So. <laughs> um, I'm the one that more has the insomnia sometimes, but. I don't know. I guess I can wrap this up. I feel like I should sing my closing song, but I don't have one. <laughs> can I make one up and sing it to you? Hey, I can go behind here and play my drum, you know, because who does not like to hear a drummer just playing, you know, like a drum solo stuff like that. <laughs> if you ever have your kids, if you have kids or you're young yourself and you're trying to decide what instrument they should pick up, just keep in mind. <laughs> Maybe an instrument that people actually want to hear. <laughs> because I can't recall one time that somebody's asked me, oh, could you play drums for me? <laughs> you know, if you got the guitar, oh, pull up the guitar, let's play, let's sing some songs. Or the piano, oh, yeah, let's play the piano and, and listen. It's like, oh, you play sax. Oh, could you play a solo for me? I want to hear it. It's like, I, you, I, I get that. I get that. People don't ask drummers to sit down and play a solo. <laughs> It's just not who we are. I know. Now, I can play xylophone and marimba a little bit and mallets, what we call mallets, which are more melodic, but I'm not very good at them. I have to admit, that is not my expertise. I was more rhythm, so I was more a snare guy and stuff like that. Not that you need to know. See, and this is me just going off onto a totally different subject that has nothing to do with what we do here. In fact, I should have already put up that little thing on the YouTube. If you if you listen to these on the YouTube, there's that little screen that comes up. And for the view more videos, you know, that thing, welcome or thank you for joining us or whatever. And sometimes that pops up while I'm still talking. I think I, I should have started that maybe about, 20, about 10, 20 minutes ago. Because <laughs> this is just me going on and on and on. And maybe there's a little fear. Maybe there's a little fear of me turning this off. And I don't know. I don't know. Because then I go back to work and I go back to the real world and I go back to everything else. But this is my little cocoon. 
we talk about that. We talk about the box and expanding the box and getting back out into the world and, and you know, that bubble, that balloon, that cocoon, whatever you want to use for it. And we talk about that expansion. Maybe one of the reasons why I love talking to you all on this podcast is because it's it's my cocoon. I don't know. But I like it here. <laughs> I like it here. And I hope you do too. Anyway, okay, this is me actually cutting this. <laughs> I'm going to stop because I could talk on and on forever. I want to thank you for joining me today for this episode of the podcast, whatever it was. I want to thank you for all you're doing to help me by writing in and talking with me, but also just for all you're doing for yourself. The fact that you're trying to learn what you can, trying to find support for what you're going through and trying to get better. It's hard work. I know it's hard work. But you owe it to yourself. It can be a long journey for some of us, but it's worth it. There's a bright light at the end. I can promise you that. It's it's a good life. You just got to get through some of the crap to get there. Our next episode should be released um, on the 1st of October or in or around there. And I got other interviews coming up and other stuff, so I'm excited to share those with you. And I want to thank you again for joining us. Let me, before I close it out, real quick, I do need to sneak in my disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzofree podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. Okay. Now, finally, finally, this should end the podcast. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. Thank you all for your kindness. And for all that you do, I'm grateful to have you all as friends. Thanks. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.